Well, this is a great turnout. Thanks so much for coming. Uh, let me begin by introducing myself. I'm Bill Galston, a senior fellow here at Brookings. And on behalf of the program in which I work, Governance Studies and the entire institution, I want to welcome you to the 14th annual edition of the American Values Survey. Uh, this has been an extraordinary partnership you know, between PRRI and Brookings, and I want to extend my thanks to Robert Jones and the entire PRRI team for allowing us to be part of this fascinating project from its inception up to the present day. It has been an intellectual feast for EJ and me, and it has also, I think, been of great benefit to the country. What is so special about the American Values Survey? Well, I suspect that most of you in this room are consumers of polls and surveys. Many of them deal with horse race questions. Who's up? Who's down? Uh, many of them deal with policy questions. You know, how many people are in favor of a 15-week ban on abortion and how many oppose it? Uh, but the AVS is something completely different. You know, it goes beneath the horse race and the policy questions to ask fundamental questions about our culture, about our religious views, about the basic principles and, yes, passions that we Americans bring to politics. Uh, and it illuminates uh, dark spaces, uh, and there are many of them. Uh, before I turn to the next phase of this program, let me remind you all to silence everything you may be carrying that could con <laughs> that conceivably could make a noise. If anybody brought a whoopee cushion, please don't sit on it. <laughs> uh, <pacemakers>. <laughs> yeah, turn off your pacemakers. <laughs> Let's see what happens. <laughs> uh, you'll hear a bit more from me at the end, but in the meantime, uh, we are about two minutes away from an extraordinary, typically extraordinary, whiz-bang presentation by Robert Jones, uh, uh, the president, the elevated president of uh, the PRRI, uh, followed by an extraordinary set of panelists. I can't wait to hear what they have to say about all of this. But to, you know, to balance the scales and to welcome you all on behalf of the Public Religion Research Institute, uh, it's now my pleasure to ask, to invite Melissa Deckman, the CEO of PRRI, uh, to the podium. Thanks so much. Thank you, Bill. Good morning, everyone. Okay, that's good, that's good. Um, welcome to the release of the 14th Annual American Values Survey. And I'm here to welcome you on behalf of PRRI, which really, since 2009, has been, I would argue, the leading nonpartisan, uh, nonprofit, and independent research organization examining the intersection of religion, culture, and politics. PRI's first and longest standing relationship, organizational partnership, is with E.J. Dion, Bill Gostin, and the Governance Studies programs here at Brookings. I'd argue it's probably our most fun relationship as well. Uh, we're grateful to E.J., to Bill, the entire staff here for helping us pull off this event at Brookings, especially Catalina Navarro, uh, who is the Senior Events Manager at the Governance Studies program. She makes the trains run on time. We're very grateful for her. Um, for those of you who are watching live on our live stream, you can find a copy of the full AVS report at www.prri.org. You can also sign up for our regular news summaries, including the Morning Buzz. We invite you to follow us for more commentary about the AVS at Twitter or X on Facebook and on Instagram at PRI Poll. And please use the hashtag uh, AVS2023 to ask to follow specific commentary about today's research. I'd also like to acknowledge the excellent work done by our staff at PRI, including Dr. Diana Ortiz, uh, Jan Huff, 
Maddie Snodgrass, Jack Shanley. We relied on the assistance of three very talented interns who helped us with the crucial work of number checking, Emily Thompson, Maddie Alexander, and Sarah Vogel. Our comms team, Colleen Ross, Jessica Royce, and Belen Bonilla have done stellar work in helping us prepare this report and, and promoting it. And I also want to thank Tony Batiste, our operations and people associate. And last but certainly not least, the world's best chief of staff, Sean Sands, who keeps us uh, on schedule and mostly under budget, mostly. Um, it is my pleasure uh, to introduce Dr. Robert P. Jones. Robbie is the president and founder of PRI, previously serving as CEO from the organization's inception in 2009 through last July. He's the award-winning author of White Too Long, The Legacy of White Supremacy in American Christianity, which won a 2021 American Book Award, and The End of White Christian America, which won the 2019 Grammar Award in Religion. His most recent book, released just last month, is The Hidden Roots of White Supremacy and the Path to a Shared American Future, and is a New York Times bestseller. He writes regularly about religion, racial justice, and politics on his White Too Long substack. Robbie holds a PhD in religion from Emory, um, MDiv from Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary, and a BS in computing science and mathematics from Mississippi College. It's my pleasure to introduce the gentleman from Mississippi, who is also in the running for speaker, actually. I don't know if you know it, but put in a plug for him. So, uh, Robbie. Well, thank you. Glad to see you all here. Um, and. Uh, in an actual room and not on Zoom. I'm still uh, happy about that. I know it's been a while, but I'm still happy to see real people in real rooms uh, talking about important issues. Um, so, you know, the, the title here, I'll just start with that, um, Threats to American Democracy Ahead of an Unprecedented Presidential Election. So this gives you some hint of the mood of the, of the, uh, of the data that we found, the findings uh, in the survey that I'm going to step through. But uh, I do think it's important to say just at the front that one of the things we're finding is that the political temperature in America is hot, and it's running high. Uh, that was so evident throughout, throughout the survey. And we're looking ahead to what is really an unprecedented um, uh, presidential election in a number of ways. Right? We have two very unpopular candidates, two of the oldest candidates uh, running uh, uh, for president, and we are following uh, the first time we did not have a peaceful transfer of power uh, in our last presidential election. And I think the reverberations of that are still with us uh, today, and that we're seeing that and through some of, some of the numbers. So I'm going to do my 30,000-foot flyover of, of the data uh, here. You've got uh, most of this in, in the chart. Um, it's digested here uh, in, in, the, in the presentation, and then we'll have a, a great panel discussion uh, uh, with it. Let me tell you, first of all, um, uh, this study was conducted at the end of August, so keep that in mind. A lot has happened uh, since the end of August, um, but that's when the survey uh, was conducted. It's um, among a little over 2,500 Americans in a random probability survey. Uh, the margin of error is plus or minus two percentage points and some change. Uh, we do want to thank uh, the Carnegie Corporation of New York. Uh, we had additional funding from the Ford Foundation, Open Society Foundations, and the Unitari Unitarian Universalist Veatch Program at Shelter Rock. So thank you to all of our funders who made this uh, survey possible. Um, so the state of the country, um, I decided I would just go ahead and cue you in here. Um, <laughs> pessimism, political violence, paranoia. Uh, right? Um, uh, if I were a preacher, I'd have three good alliterative points um, here. Um, so let's kind of start with um, the public really does see uh, that there's a lot at stake in the 2024 election. We had, uh, This question, the future of American democracy is at stake in the 2024 presidential election. Three quarters of Americans agree with that statement. Um, it is one of the few things in the survey that all partisans agree on. Right, Republicans, independents, Democrats, all overwhelmingly saying uh, the future of democracy uh, is at stake in the 2024 presidential election. Um, we've been asking a, a question about how the country has changed since the 1950s um, uh, here uh, for a number of years. I think this is 2015. We first started asking this question. Uh, it has been fairly steady um, over that time. And I'm pairing this question here with another question, uh, this, a, a pessim another kind of pessimism question. America's best days are now behind us, a little gloomier uh, version of that question. So since the 1950s, American culture and way of life has changed mostly for the worse. This is where Americans are, right? All Americans on those questions. So fairly pessimistic um, on that question. But there are ginormous partisan divides 
uh, on this uh, on these on both of these questions. As you can see, Republicans three quarters uh, say since the 1950s, American culture has in a way of life has changed uh, for the worst. Uh, that's uh, more than twice the number of Democrats that say that. And you can see the same patterns really on both of these um, uh, questions, even the more gloomier one uh, here. Uh, white evangelical Protestants, Republicans, overwhelmingly the two groups that stick out, um, saying that since the 1950s, American culture and way of life has mostly changed for the worst. Uh, generally speaking, we'll find this. We have white Christian groups at the top here, evangelicals, even uh, mainline non-evangelical Protestants and white Catholics, all more likely to sort of have a pessimistic view, particularly uh, about how the country has changed since the 1950s. Um, the other, I think, main finding that we had, and one of the ones that is, I, I think, grabbed me as perhaps the most disturbing finding in the, in the country, is that we find uh, considerable uh, support for the idea that true American patriots may have to resort to violence in order to save the country uh, because things have become uh, gotten so far off track. So these are the numbers that we first asked this question in, in 2021, right? It was 15% of the country, but it was 28%, nearly 3 in 10 Republicans, only 7% of Democrats uh, said that. We found that this attitude has actually gone up over the last uh, two years, right? So in the country, it's now a quarter of Americans, uh, 23%, who say that, True American patriots may have to resort to violence in order to save the country. It has gone to fully a third of Republicans. It's gone up across the board. Uh, Democrats has gone up six points as well to 13 uh, percent, but it's still two and a half times. Republicans are two and a half times more likely uh, to say this uh, than are uh, Democrats. Uh, among religious groups, uh, we see a similar uptick across the board, uh, but a more pronounced uptick among white evangelical Protestants. Most other religious groups are about at the national average, around 23%, um, but white evangelicals tick up. Uh, notably here, Catholics are a little bit under. Uh, both white Catholics and Latino Catholics are a little bit under uh, uh, the national average, uh, not, by, not by a lot, but it's white evangelicals that are jumping out as the, as the group most likely to hold this view. So in unpacking this view, um, we also looked at what are the high, some of the higher correlational attitudes that correlate with this belief uh, that we may have to resort to violence in order to save the country. Uh, so it, again, a quarter, a quarter of Americans here. Uh, the, the highest thing uh, is actually uh, support for uh, holding a favorable view of Trump or uh, most uh, likely the 2020 election was stolen uh, from Donald Trump. Uh, 46%, nearly half of that group, if you believe that the 2020 uh, election was stolen, uh, nearly half say true American patriots may have to resort uh, to violence. Um, another attitude, again, about 4 in 10, if you believe in the so-called great replacement theory uh, that's making the rounds on kind of conservative right-wing uh, media, that, and we asked this, we operationalized this in the survey with this question, immigrants are invading our country and replacing our cultural and ethnic background. If you agree with that, Four in ten of that group is uh, likely to say, say that true American patriots may have to resort to violence. Um, a question that we have that measures um, an attitude um, around white Christian nationalism. Uh, if you agree that God intended America to be a new promised land for European Christians, four in ten of that group uh, say uh, that we may have to resort to violence in order to save the country. If you hold patriarchal views, um, society as a whole but has become too soft and feminine. We've been asking this question for quite a while. It's a very predictive uh, question about vote and other attitudes. Uh, again, nearly 4 in 10. And <clears throat> finally, uh, if, uh, basically a denial of systemic racism. Uh, if you believe that the recent killings of black Americans by police are isolated incidents rather than part of a pattern of how police treat African Americans, 3 in 10 of that group uh, says... Uh, that they uh, believe that true American patriots may have to resort to violence in order to save the country. So to kind of like recap, the kind of positive correlations here are the big lie, favorable views of Trump, great replacement theory, white Christian nationalism, patriarchy, and denials of systemic racism. Right? Those are the things that are connected uh, uh, most closely and positively to this idea uh, that true American patriots may have to re uh, resort to violence in order to save the country. It also gives you some clue about what save the country means, right, in these, in these questions. Um, the other, I think, uh, kind of disturbing thing we found is actually a rise in the number of Americans who believe in QAnon. Uh, 
right, who hold these QAnon beliefs. Now, we've measured this since 2021 at PRI. We've operationalized it with uh, three questions, and they are, uh, one of these questions, or actually two of them, are ones I, I never really thought as a, a sociologist I would write um, as a question. We actually asked Americans whether they believe that the government and business elites are controlled by a group of Satan-worshipping pedophiles that are involved in a sex trafficking operation. Right? We asked that question right, and, and asked Americans if they agree or disagree with that question. Uh, the other question was kind of an apocalyptic question that, that QAnon has, uh, this belief that uh, there is a storm coming uh, that's going to sweep away uh, the current leadership and install the rightful leaders. And kind of this sounds familiar. It actually borrows from Christian theology, this kind of apocalyptic uh, uh, view. And then the other measure that's baked in here is, is the measure on violence as well, uh, this idea that true American patriots may have to save the country. Uh, so uh, this is the doubters um, line I've kind of started with here. It's remained fairly steady, actually. The people who mostly doubt that's true, they don't completely disagree with all three of those statements, but they mostly disagree uh, with them. But here are the number of Americans who agree with all of those statements, right? It has gone from 14% when we first measured it to 23% uh, in, the, in the last uh, couple of years. And here are the number of people who disagree with all of those statements, right? It's gone from 40% down to 29% um, over the last couple of years. So it's actually gaining some traction, this, this kind of QAnon conspiracy uh, theory uh, in, the, in the American public. Um, uh, it is more likely, I'm just going to put all the numbers up here, it is more likely to be um, uh, these views to, to hold among Republicans. In fact, they're twice as likely as Democrats uh, to hold these views. Uh, Democrats are more than three, are three times as likely to reject um, uh, uh, those views uh, than Republicans are. You can kind of see those numbers here. So again, it's, it's more operational among Republicans and among uh, political conservatives um, in the country. Another place where you can see just the uh, you know, absolute polarization in the country is if we look at what issues uh, partisans say are important. And in this survey, we asked 20 issues, right, and just say, rate them. Are they critical issues or not, uh, are not to you? Um, and what I've got on this slide are the, are the issues out of that 20 that Democrat, that half or more Democrats said were critical issues uh, to them. You can see it's actually quite a range of things. There are climate change, access to guns and gun safety, health care, the growing gap between the rich and the poor, and abortion, uh, about half. Uh, so it ranges from you know, two-thirds up around climate change down to uh, half uh, of Democrats saying that abortion is a critical issue. But watch what happens when I put up the number of Republicans who agree with these issues as critical issues, right? Um, there, there's the only place where there's agreement is increasing cost of housing and everyday expenses, right? So kind of day-to-day -day costs in the economy is the only place that we see um, uh, agreement here. It's also notable, and we'll come back to this in a minute, that on abortion, Democrats are far more likely today to rate this issue as critical than Republicans, and that's new post the Dobbs decision. Right? It used to be the other way around. We used to always see Republicans rating that issue more highly uh, than Democrats, but since Dobbs, we've been seeing it uh, flip the other way. Um, I'm going to do the same exercise here with Republicans. Here are the things that Republicans um, say. Uh, these are the only things out of 20 uh, issues where anywhere near like half or more Republicans say are critical issues. Um, so again, cost of housing and everyday expenses, the only thing that's on both lists. Uh, but what children learn in public schools, crime, immigration, <laughs> human trafficking, and here's where Democrats are, right, on those issues. Again, uh, agree on cost of housing, come close on crime and, and human trafficking, but very different on immigration, what children learn in public school. Uh, but if you kind of put these, two, these things together, the, the Democratic uh, list was far, like, very diverse, it's kind of over the map, but this, if you kind of look at what holds these things together other than the economic thing, it's a kind of fear, protection, uh, those kinds of motifs, right? For protection from without, protection from danger within, what children are being taught in school, immigration, uh, crime. It, it, it's around a kind of fearfulness and protection uh, ideas that are, that are really animating uh, Republicans in the country today. Um, this is also notable. We had a, a question where we asked, uh, basically a litmus test question. Uh, would you only vote for a candidate if they shared your views on these, this number of issues. Now, most, for the most part, Americans aren't litmus test voters, despite what many politicians want to think. They tend to vote in more complex ways uh, than that. But So anything that's sort of high on here is actually quite notable. Uh, again, echoing what I showed before, um, today we have half of Democrats saying they would not vote for a candidate who did not share their views on abortion. Again, it's much higher uh, than the number of Republicans uh, saying that. So I'll kind of bake that in, right, because I think there is uh, the sense that Republicans are single-issue voters on this issue, and it's just not true, 
right? Um, so this is what Republicans are, are telling us here. Um, uh, they're actually more likely to say um, access to guns is something that, that they would um, uh, only vote for candidates if they shared their views. Uh, you can see the big difference on climate change here, but four in 10 Democrats saying uh, they would not vote for a candidate who doesn't share their views on climate change. Very similar uh, numbers on LGBTQ rights. Uh, and here's immigration, right? So uh, for Democrats, it really is access to guns uh, and abortion kind of up around half. Um, uh, and for Republicans, the top two are access to guns, but in a very different way, uh, and immigration uh, down here driving, saying they would only vote for a candidate. But I think this abortion finding is the one to kind of hang on to uh, for future um, analysis. So the candidates. Uh, we had a new question we asked this year about whether what, what people are looking for in a presidential candidate. And we, the way we put it, are you looking for a candidate who's better at managing the economy or who can best protect and preserve American culture and American way of life? Here. So here's where all Americans are, slightly leaning more toward the economy, uh, but big differences among partisans, right? So uh, Democrats, much more likely to say looking for a president who manages the economy. Republicans, much more likely to say looking for a president who protect and preserve um, <clears throat> American culture and American way of life. Uh, religious groups, um, uh, sorted particularly uh, mostly the way you would see them. The one, uh, one thing to note down here is African-American Protestants are actually much more divided uh, than one might think uh, on this question. So, <clears throat> and actually have a 52% slight majority saying uh, that they preserve, uh, want a president who will protect and preserve American culture and way of life. Uh, my best guess is that they mean something very different than the white evangelical sitting next to them uh, in this chart who want to preserve American culture uh, and way of life. But we can kind of pick this back up um, in the discussion. <clears throat> uh, favorability of candidates. I mentioned this. Uh, so uh, Biden is, again, end of August, uh, but Biden's favorability, 37%. Uh, that is the lowest we found it since we've been tracking this um, uh, among Biden's favorability. Uh, but look at everybody else, right? Um, this is where they were um, at the end of August. There's really no candidate jumping out. Uh, those are the unfavorables um, on the other side. Biden does you know, much better on the unfavorables uh, than Trump. Uh, but it's not a popular field anywhere right um, here, uh, which is worth, uh, I think, noting. One other thing that I think the survey showed us, um, we asked about uh, among Biden supporters we, and, and among Trump supporters, we asked them if there's anything that the candidate could do that might lose, cause them to lose their support. So among uh, Biden supporters, 59% uh, said, yeah, there's something he could do. But 39%, 4 in 10 said, yeah, there's virtually nothing to do. I'm locked in. Virtually nothing uh, Biden could do to lose my support. <clears throat> Here's the equivalent numbers for Trump. Among Trump supporters, it's 45%. Who's, who are locked in, saying there's virtually nothing he could do uh, to lose my support. So again, this is among uh, the kind of firmness of support among their uh, supporters. So Trump actually has an advantage here among his own supporters uh, of, of people saying, yeah, there's virtually nothing he could do uh, to lose my support. Um, <clears throat> we did ask about um, uh, Trump's alleged criminal conduct. Uh, all, among all Americans, it's 6 in 10 who both agree uh, there's credible evidence that Donald Trump committed serious federal crimes, and it's likely that former President Trump broke the law to try to stay in power. However, look at the partisan di divides uh, on this number, right? It's really only about a quarter of Republicans who believe either one. Um, of these statements. And then also, um, we, we, we've been asking for a while uh, at PRI about which television news outlets you most trust uh, here. And you can see the way that um, uh, f particularly Fox News uh, and far-right news outlets like One American News, Newsmax, and people actually to the right of Fox are shaping uh, you know, these views. Like it just drops off a cliff among the kind of far-right uh, news like One American News or Newsmax. And among Fox News, it looks basically like Republicans here. But really, uh, people who don't watch television news or any other television news source have very different views right, on, uh, on uh, uh, whether or not Trump committed serious crimes. Um, we asked about a, a two-way vote, and I'm going to show it to you by, by religion. One of the most remarkable things here is that this looks very, very similar to the exit polls. Um, there's very little movement uh, here that to, to begin. The one place I would, I would point to that is a little bit of a shift is among African-American Protestants. We're seeing some, a little bit of weakness here. Um, it was uh, less than 1 in 10 uh, uh, African-American Protestants uh, that, that voted for Trump, and we're measuring 16 here. What it looks like when you compare it to the exit polls is that most of the people who are out here saying, I don't know, or they skipped the question, uh, it looks like in the last uh, election most of those people went to the majority there, right? So this is the typical pattern. Uh, Three-quarters to eight and ten white evangelicals supporting Trump. 
Uh, but also, it's worth remembering because I think people forget, uh, the other two big groups of white Christians also vote for Trump. Uh, six and ten white mainline Protestants, six and ten uh, white Catholics, that's right where we are. Um, so really, not much movement at all with that one caveat of that 16% among African-American Protestants may look a little bit high. Again, it's a long way out, but it, it's, to me, it's remar- the stability is what's remarkable given everything that's happened um, uh, since the last election. Um, along those lines, we ask about whether um, people thought whether the election of Biden or Trump means uh, that democracy is broken. In other words, if, if this other candidate wins, it means the democracy is broken. We may need to look for a different form of government. So we try to ask it in a very strong way. Uh, it looks that about um, 45 percent of all Americans say if Trump wins the election, it means democracy is broken. Uh, and 38 uh, percent say that about Joe Biden. Uh, partisans, not unpredictably, um, have very different views uh, of this. Um, and then also here are um, uh, the numbers among religious groups. Uh, you'll see kind of down below, the kind of white Christian groups uh, down below, the least likely groups to say that if Donald Trump is elected, uh, we may need, uh, the, the, that means that democracy is broken. Uh, but Kind of remarkably, numbers of both, right, uh, saying that that, that candidate uh, is elected, it means that democracy is broken. So I'm going to do a quick run through just a couple of other findings to set the table, and then I will turn it over to our panelists. Um, this one, I think, is a, a measure of e- economic pessimism. I sometimes think about this as kind of a, a proxy for the American dream, uh, because part of that is the idea that if you follow the rules, you get a good college education, you'll get ahead, right? This, I, this is kind of the upward mobility story that education has played in, in this idea of the American dream. Uh, Americans are becoming less and less convinced that that's true, uh, right? So this is a college education, and rather than uh, 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 this question asks whether a college education is a good investment in the future or whether it's a risky gamble that may not pay off. These are the numbers of people saying it's a risky gamble that may not pay off. Most of this occurred during the Trump presidency, right? This kind of upward tick of people saying it's a risky gamble, but it's gone up across the board, right? It's not just Republicans, it's Republicans and Democrats uh, thinking this. Republicans are more likely uh, the Democrats, but it's gone up uh, kind of across the board. It's kind of economic pessimism. Um, the other one uh, we, we, is, is one we asked because we've seen this kind of um, on the Texas border in particular, uh, this uh, installing these kind of dangerous deterrents, um, like things like floating barriers and rivers that may drown people, razor wire that, to prevent immigrants from uh, entering the country illegally. And we even added this phrase, like, even if they endanger or kill people, do you favor uh, putting up uh, these barriers? Uh, f- most Americans do not, but it's 44% who say they do favor uh, these variables. Um, but that is the partisan gap uh, on this. It's nearly 60 points uh, uh, on this question, right? Um, nearly 8 in 10 Republicans saying, yes, a favor of these deterrents, even if they endanger or kill people. Um, and uh, speaking as someone who writes a lot about white Christianity, I would say, like, this is maybe the most heartbreaking finding in the survey uh, for me um, as, as someone writes about this group. Um, white evangelicals, it's really white Christians, right, who are the most likely to say, Yes, we favor these kind of barriers, even if they endanger or kill people, um, to, to keep immigrants from um, entering the country illegally. So I'm not going to uh, completely stop on a, on a negative note um, here, um, but one kind of ambiguity that we're finding in the, in the survey, there's been a lot of um, uh, talk uh, and, and debate and uh, uh, kind of noise around uh, transgender people and the rights of transgender people in the country. And it turns out there is a lot of confusion about this. We had two different questions uh, and both of them, we had a majority saying uh, that they agreed to them, and they're, they're opposite questions. So people advocating for the rights of transgender people have gone too far uh, in recent years, and restricting, restricting the rights of transgender people is just another form of discrimination. Majorities of Americans agree with both of those statements, right, at the same time. And so I think that's important to kind of hang on to. You can see that the patterns are what you would think they are in terms of partisanship, uh, but even among Republicans, for example, um, 85% say advocates have gone too far, but 43% of Republicans also say uh, that restricting the rights of transgender people is just another form of discrimination. I uh, see uh, similar patterns among um, uh, religious groups, and the, the most consistent groups, which I think tells you something, are among uh, kind of consumers of different media, right? That's where you see the most consistent messages here, and particularly among kind of far-right news groups, there's the least amount of overlap uh, there, um, where I think they're getting one message and one message only uh, in those media. So I promise not to leave you too much in doom and gloom. There are a couple of uh, places here. I'm going to end on this. Uh, there is very little support for banning a whole variety of things in public schools, 
right? We're hearing a lot of that from the local level, uh, state level um, uh, in the country. But it turned, we asked about uh, banning the discussion of sexual orientation and gender identity, banning social and emotional learning programs, banning high school courses like AP African American History, and banning books depicting slavery. Um, again, no, none of those comes anywhere near reaching majority support. Um, there is majority support among Republicans uh, for banning the discussion of sexual orientation and gender identity in schools. But look, independents are not there, and Democrats uh, uh, are not uh, Democrats are not there uh, as well. I mean, the numbers here, again, you know, this is 50 percentage points between Republicans and Democrats on this, uh, on, on this issue. And then finally, um, I think uh, maybe one of the most heartening findings in the survey um, is there's great confidence, actually, about what uh, the curriculum in public schools. Again, this is something we hear a lot of uh, controversy about, but we ask um, two options. Should we teach, uh, which, which one do you agree with more? We should teach our children both the good and the bad aspects of our history so they can learn from the past, or we should not teach children history that should make them feel uncomfortable or guilty about what their ancestors did in the past. That's right out of those critical race theory bills, right? That language uh, there. Four percent agree with that second uh, part, of the, part of the statement, right? Ninety-four uh, percent agree with the first one. Uh, s different question, but similar findings. Um, public school teachers and librarians are professionals whom we should trust to provide our kids with appropriate curriculum and books that teach the good and the bad of American history, or public school teachers and librarians should not be allowed to develop curriculum and teach books that wrongly portray America as a racist country. Um, again, 22 percent of the country uh, believes in that, but overwhelmingly, three quarters of the country says, Public school teachers uh, and librarians are professionals we should trust uh, to teach, uh, teach your kids appropriately. So on that note, I'm going to stop and invite the panel uh, to come up uh, and join us. I wait for Robbie's incredible slide presentation every year, and he never disappoints. Uh, thank you, Robbie. And I'm really honored to celebrate the 14th year of this partnership. I was thinking about why are our findings uh, so kind of tetchy and difficult uh, this year, and I realized this partnership is entering its adolescence. Uh, and so if we can get through the next five, six years, we will finally produce really happy findings uh, for um, everyone in the world. Uh, I do uh, want to thank Robbie and uh, Melissa and Bill and uh, Max and Catalina. We, we've, got, we work, we've really been blessed to work with great people. Um, and we also have an awesome panel here uh, to respond to these findings, so, you know, historically in our adolescent uh, partnership, we've just had uh, our respondents have added enormously to our understandings of the findings, and we're really grateful uh, that they. We are, I know they're going to do so again this year. Um, to my immediate left, Joy Reed, uh, the host of the uh, readout on MSNBC at 7 p.m. Uh, every uh, week during the week. Um, and it's great to have Joy back, who is one of the earliest respondents to our uh, findings. Uh, Liliana Mason is an extraordinary scholar. Um, well, actually, I've got the order. Russell Contreras. Let me go to Russell. He is the senior race uh, and justice uh, reporter at Axios and has done extraordinary work. And we're really honored to have you here today. And then uh, Liliana Mason, who is an associate professor of political science uh, and also a researcher at the Agora Institute at Johns Hopkins. Um, she's, she is particularly qualified to answer today because she's done extraordinary work on violence, on polarization. Um, she has also come and visited with my students in the past, and they loved her, and you will too. Uh, so let's uh, start with Joy. We're going to go through the panel. Robbie will respond to them. Uh, I'll ask a few questions. I'm also just going to um, we got a lot of really good questions online. I cannot ask them all. Um, at some point, I'm going to read off a bunch of them to see if anyone wants to respond to any of them uh, in particular. And uh, we will, of course, eventually go to the audience uh, uh, as well. I'd like to ask if anybody is from the media here, since they're the folks who are going to have to write about and make sense of this poll, please identify yourselves uh, early on, and we'll be happy to 
turn to you early, but you don't have to be in the media to ask a question. Uh, so without further ado, Joy, welcome. Great to have you back. Thank you very much, EJ. It's great to be reunited with, uh, with, this, with this crew, Melissa, Bill, Catalina. Thank you all very much uh, for having me. It's always fun, fun being here. Um, it's been a while since I've done this. Yeah. Um, and so, huh, it's, uh, on our show, our subtitle uh, is Scaring is Caring. So thank you, Robbie, uh, because <laughs> bad news is helpful. It's good. Bad news is good. Um, as I listened to the presentation, as I read through it um, earlier, the question that I ask myself is violence for what? Violence to what end, right? If you have a, a, a third of Republicans saying that we may need to resort to violence, and then you marry that to the idea that America's uh, best days are behind it and that we need to restore the country culturally, it does bring to mind the sort of leading question of uh, what people think we need violence for. Um, it sounds like um, if you put together what's happening in the news cycle, violence to install the leader of Republicans' preference, which would be Donald Trump, which is what he wants. Um, and so I, I feel like we are in a really perilous stage in this country, except for people's love of librarians and teachers, which thank God for that, because that was <laughs> uplifting at the end. Um, but people do not have confidence in democracy as a way to solve their fundamental concerns. And for Democrats, as you can see from the survey, the fundamental concerns are things like uh, wealth inequality, climate change, um, uh, economic issues. Those are the concerns. For Republicans, the concerns seem to be very strictly cultural. Um, and that the thing they want to restore is cultural, um, a sort of retrograde kind of culture that you can't get back. And so we're at a fundamental problem where one party is, has p concerns that are fundamentally political, things that politics can solve, and the other party has concerns that are ephemeral and that are emotional, which politics actually can't solve. Um, and I will just say that what this brought me back to, the survey results brought me back to, is something that I think is true is that the three kind of, current, the kind of modern-day flashpoints um, in our society, in our culture, are the election and re-election of Barack Obama, which was a, a, a cultural hurricane um, for particularly white voters, six and ten of whom voted for the other two guys, the other Republicans, and their will was subsumed by this combination of voters of color um, and younger voters and college-educated white voters. And so you had a 60% of white Americans overruled twice by 10 million votes and then by 5 million votes by the election of the first black president. To me, that was a huge flashpoint that produced Trump. The second flashpoint being Trump's, his presidency itself, which was kind of a, kind of a, a ritualistic um, four years of attacking the culture that Obama represented. Um, and then his failure to turn over power peacefully, the peaceful transition of power, which, by the way, kind of is an American tradition, Wilmington, North Carolina, you know, the Civil War. <laughs> like, it's not like America hasn't tried to not have peaceful transfers of power before. It's kind of part of our cultural history, but it's the first time it happened in the Capitol. So that's the second flashpoint. And the third, I, say, I would say, would be COVID, um, which is when, in a lot of ways, America went mad. Mm. Um, people sat home doom-scrolling, I think part of the QAnon growth was because of that, uh, a sense of paranoia about political power and what politics could force you to do about governmental control and, and just a, a raw paranoia that Trump and, and others sort of, um, and social media played into. So I think those three flashpoints, to me, uh, are borne out in this poll. And it leaves me quite pessimistic, actually, about our democracy. So um, that's my good news report of the day. <laughs> um. Yep. And now for a dissent on different, <laughs> on different bad news. Right, go ahead, Russell. Yeah, so I was in New Mexico yesterday at the airport, and I was reading over the report uh, just to make sure that I had all my stats in order. And I got a call from one of my friends, an indigenous brother from Gallup, New Mexico, who's Navajo. And I was just saying, this is a, I'm reading this report. It's terrible because it's saying that the ri there's a rise in people endorsing, uh, could endorse violence if they don't agree with some of the pol political outcomes. Can you believe this, that people would want to wipe out other people? And without missing a beat, my indigenous friend said, nah, I've never heard that story before. <laughs> I just, just passed my mind. <laughs> so I, and then I started thinking about it, is we've seen this before. If you think of Tulsa, Oklahoma, Rosewood, Florida, Puerto Texas, 
uh, wounded knee, South Dakota, that whenever the country sees any sort of demographic change, threats, especially from people of color, violence will occur, and they'll be wiped off the face of the earth. So this is why it kind of resonated with me when I saw this, that this is a story that's it's rhyming with the past. The difference is we don't have just one Ida B. Wells. We have many now. We can document it. So on, on that front, I'm hopeful. When I saw this and I saw that there's a rise in violence, and I see there's also anxiety about demographic change, what I see is the last graphs of power, which Rob has talked about this in his recent book, which I highly recommend that you will go out and get, is that this country for years has been a haven for European white Christians. And the belief that that is slipping away, that it's being redefined, people are acting the way they are violently. That's one of the things that stood up. The other was the idea of this once fringed belief of white replacement theory. It's now supported by 40, around 40% of Americans. This is a conspiracy theory that supposed that people of color are conspiring with this wide, elaborate plan to replace white people. I can assure you, Joy and I are members of the National Association of Black Journalists. We go to the conference every year. If we're not on panels, eating, or dancing, we're fighting. <laughs> we're fighting constantly, and usually that evening about what to have to dinner or where to have the convention next time. <laughs> so this theory supposes that we, who can't even get together on the same page on the cookout, <laughs> we're going to somehow conspire to replace white people. And it's being repeated over and over now on mainstream cable opinion channels that we're coming out and we're going to replace you in the political space, the economic space, the baseball team. Well, we're doing that. Uh, it's, that's, that's obvious. But there's this anxiety, and therefore, some sort of violence is going to be needed. This is something that has resonated me, and this is something that I see. And I think one of the things we're missing is the idea that history continues to be taught and viewed by some as a tool to reinforce nationalism, coming out of the Cold War. And yes, I did see the, the results that said, no, we need to start teaching the, both the good and bad about history. That seems to be a, a very good telling point, because if I came in here and I saw Joy, and I immediately didn't like her shoes, you promoted me all, oh, this guy's great, he's going to crack a few jokes, he's good to hear. But if I saw Joy and I didn't like her shoes and I pushed her and she happened to break her leg, you would cancel me right away and say, this person's a bad person. However, we can't do that in history. We have documented evidence that some of our founders owned and traded human beings. We have evidence that some of these same people removed and killed other people off their lands. And yet it's been difficult for us to even get people to acknowledge that that happened, that George Washington, according to Erica Dunbar's book, went and tried to retrieve his property, who left when he was president. And to bring it up as somehow woke? No, that's facts. And so now we're at a time or a point where we need to embrace those facts. Democracy thrives on information. And if we don't have the right information, like the stock market, you're going to invest in something that's going to decline. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, Liliana. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for inviting me to this. This is very fascinating data. Um, so those violence numbers were a real gut punch, I think, for most people. Uh, the, one of the things that I've been doing since 2017 is measuring American attitudes toward political violence. So we have some sense of, of you know, a trend across time. These are much higher than most of what we've seen. Um, but I also want to urge caution in interpreting those exact numbers, partly because um, this is getting into the weeds here, but um, the phrase true patriots is more likely to be embraced by Republicans. Um, so we're worried about two things. We're worried about the difference between partisans in the amount of violence that they endorse, and we're also worried about the change over time. So in the difference between partisans, I do think that it's possible that the levels among Republicans are slightly inflated because this is a QAnon belief. Um, it's a QAnon belief, and it's also something that Republicans have kind of taken the mantle of calling themselves true Americans, patriots, um, and Democrats also know this, and they, and they often shy away from that phrase. So I'm weirdly, like, urging, <laughs> urging just to calm down a little bit. It's, it's not fine. Um, 
but it is important to to remember that these numbers are they can also be context dependent. So one thing that we did in a lot of our research was to say, you know, our question was to what extent do you think um, it's acceptable to use violence to achieve your political goals? And those numbers have gradually increased among both Democrats and Republicans over over even the 2017 to 2022 data that we had. Um, but then if we ask a follow-up question on what did, what did you mean when you said violence? And, and often uh, what we hear from that is that, de- first of all, Democrats and Republicans are quite different on what they meant to begin with. Democrats are much bigger fans of property damage. Um, Republicans generally are more likely to be thinking about armed, uh, armed resistance. And, but but ev- ac- across both, um, if we say, were you thinking about killing people? Only like 20% of the people who said violence was okay were willing to say it's okay to kill people, right? So not everyone there is thinking, I want to murder other people. So that's good. (laughs) 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 Trying to find the the silver lining. Um, The other reason I want to urge caution, though, is because one thing that political scientists have found over and over again is that when we perceive the other side to be violent we become more accepting of, violent, of violence ourselves. And, and in addition, most Democrats and Republicans believe that the other side is more violent than they actually are. And when you correct their understanding, they become less approving of violence themselves. So to the extent that we are interpreting these data, uh, it's important to remember that we're also communicating a message to voters about how violent their political opponents are And it's important for us to understand that when we do that, we may be fostering a sense of increasing violence um, among partisans themselves. So that's another reason to be cautious. I'll just end with something less in the weeds, um, which is that the um, one another thing that we've looked at is interventions that could maybe bring these attitudes down. So things that can make people approve of violence less. And and one of the things we tested was messages from leaders. So very simple, just like one sentence from, from uh, Donald Trump or Joe Biden saying violence is not acceptable, it should not be part of our politics. Uh, and reading that just one sentence made people step back. So our leaders are extraordinarily influential. Um, also asking people to think about um, the people who kind of structured their sense of being a member of a society, so teachers, coaches. Um, when, when we ask them to think about that person, after they think about it, they're less approving of violence. So even just creating, kind of inculcating this sense of who am I in a society? What do we owe each other? How do I interact with other human beings? That also reduces people's approval of violence. The reason we've seen an uptick, I think, in, in approval of violence over these few years is actually because our leaders have stopped saying that. And our, our social sort of civic leaders have also not been saying it clearly enough. And so one very easy thing for us to do, not easy, but concrete thing for us to do is to try to encourage our leaders to make it very, very clear to their supporters and to people who trust them and follow them that these types of attitudes do not have a place in a a healthy democracy, and this is not something that we should be accepting on the whole. Thank you so much. Um, I wonder, just out of curiosity, I was struck by the media differences in this survey, which I want to get to. Um, some leaders are saying it more than others, no, <laughs> Liliana? Oh, absolutely, about right, yeah. yeah. Um, and, the, and part of the reason we see the partisan difference is that Republican leaders are not condemning violence. Right. Um, in particular, Donald Trump, but also other leaders who, you know, when, when, some, when somebody says something violent, everyone is, it's crickets among the Republican Party, usually. So the, it's, not even a, it's not even like they're saying pro-violent things, they're just not saying anything when there is violence. And I would also argue that the media are leaders. Right-wing media are opinion leaders, especially in the Republican Party. And when those media leaders don't um, express this resistance to violence, their supporters are ready to go along with it. Thank you. I want, Robbie, I want you to respond, and, I, and I'll, I'll try to put your response in a context, because one of the most striking things about this survey is that both sides say democracy is in danger, but from a completely different set of assumptions. Uh, that's sort of division one. Division two is a lot of times 
elections are debates over how to solve particular problems. People agree on the problems, but they have different solutions, and then they argue about their solutions. What's so striking here is we're having elections in two different countries uh, in terms of the issue list. I don't know how many of you, if any of you are sports fans and watch television in this area, there are a ton of ads uh, from the legislative races in uh, uh, Virginia uh, that are coming up in November. If you watch those ads, there are only two issues. It's either abortion and MAGA in the Democratic ads or crime and defund the police in the Republican ads. They are just astonishingly different. Um, and sort of reflect on this because I think, you know, it, it, bringing us ourselves together when we've disagreed about solutions to common problems is quite different from having utterly different agendas and utterly different definitions of the word democracy. Well, thanks for that easy question. Um, uh, EJ. So, You're a really smart guy. You have all these degrees. <laughs> right, right. Well, I'm going to say the big picture um, here on that question because I, I, I think you're right that when people say democracy is broken, they fear that democracy uh, is under threat, they are think, uh, Americans are thinking about different things. And I, and I, I think that the, the thing that uh, you know, a lot of my research has been around, like, what do kind of white Christian people think? Right when they're and they are thinking something quite different. I think when they're thinking democracy is under threat, and all that. And and it, I think the 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 work we've done, you know, with, with you and Bill on white Christian nationalism, I think is is a clue here. And that's a kind of newer term, but it's a very old question, right? And the the question for us really that I think we're still trying to answer as a country is essentially this one: Are we a pluralistic democracy where everybody stands on equal footing uh, before the law, or are we a kind of divinely ordained promised land for European Christians. Like, is that who we are? Um, right? And those are fundamentally different visions of the country. I think it's a part of what we're... So you think about replacement, right? Or else you talked about that. Like, well, what's the placement part of that, right? <laughs> <laughs> right? If you think about the placement part of that, right? It is, uh, as you know, your indigenous friends, it is European Christians coming in with a divine mandate to dis displace... Uh, the original inhabitants of this, uh, to displace Africans and sort of uh, harness their labor uh, for free in this country. Like, that's a big part of what's going on. And then I think the other difficult thing, and I think why, uh, you, Joy, you mentioned, like, America going mad. Uh, and I, th I think you're right that COVID and then just kind of how that really scrambled everything was part of it in the midst of Obama to Trump and COVID. I think you're absolutely right that that cocktail has just been disastrous uh, uh, for, for the country. And, and it all, all that occurred while the country was moving from being a majority white Christian country to one that was no longer a majority white Christian country. All of that happened at the same time, right? So demographic shift past this milestone. So I think in some ways it's no wonder that we've got this kind of volatile cocktail, and I think we're at this dangerous inflection point in our history. Uh, we're being test, tested, right, in many ways to see which of those two questions, which of those two visions of the country uh, are the ones that we're going to ultimately embrace and move forward into. And there's a real fight about that. Can I just add to yeah. that that I think I would throw one more thing in there. You know, I think people, if, if the timelines get mushed because it's like every day is Wednesday and like it's always, you know, late August. I don't know. It feels like time has kind of stopped. But in the midst of, pen, of the pandemic, that's also the, when George Floyd happened. Mm -hmm. yeah. So yep. you have people sitting home um, watching, you know, with their adult children back in the house. And especially for white Americans, watching their kids become woke. Mm -hmm. And so this panic over not just demographic change, but also ideological change among their own kids. I think part of the panic among, you know, I'm going through some of these numbers, the people who are the most um, concerned about democracy being broken are not even Gen Z, right? It's, it's slightly higher among millennials who are also incredibly economically, uh, you know, shaky, mm -hmm. um, partly because of the pandemic. You know, a lot of the opportunities for Gen Z and millennials evaporated during the pandemic. So you have like a lot of economically anxious young people who actually, you know, per this, these numbers report more concern over the economy, over being able to afford a place to live, over being able to afford rent. So they're the ones who are economically anxious, not MAGA voters, older voters, Trump voters. They're more economically secure. So their only concern is the ideological change of their own kids, 
um, on everything from race to LGBTQ issues. Um, and so that, to me, underscores the panic about, hi- about what's being taught in school. Because, like, how did my kids become like this? You know what I mean? I'm not woke. How are my kids so woke? Why are they so um, concerned about trans kids? Why are they so concerned about George Floyd? Why are my white kids in the streets doing a Black Lives Matter march? Mm. That's panicky, right? And so you have a lot more similarity. You know, one of the striking things, it's not in this survey, but is, is in actually the exit polls from 2022, for, for the first time, white Americans under 30 voted majority Democratic. I mean, people forget, even with Obama, the majority of white Americans, regardless of age, vote rep- are Republicans. It's just you throw a rock at 10 white Americans, six of them are Republicans, no matter who the <laughs> candidate is. But that has now started to change by age. Yeah. So now under 30, it's particularly college-educated white people under 30 have gone the other way. They voted like 55% for the Democrats. And that's the first time that's happened. That's in 2022. So the panic over Biden among conservatives is also, I think, about their own kids and about the generations that they no longer can control their ideology. They're becoming less religious. They're less likely to report as Christian. They're less likely to be any religion at all. They're much more ecumenical when it comes to that. And they're much more ecumenical when it comes to race. Although, you know, they're racist young people too. But Basically, it, you know, the majorities are shifting the other way. Thank you. I, I want the whole panel to respond to this kind of how we are different countries. But let me also throw another question in the mix, which is um, there were some really disconcerting numbers here for President Biden. Mm-hmm. Um, and one, th- one thing struck me, which is on the one hand, the survey says that Democrats are more likely than Republicans to vote on the economy as opposed to cultural issues. And yet the one issue that crosses party lines is concern about prices, uh, about high prices. This strikes me as a real challenge uh, to uh, Biden and the Democrats. Um, Liliana, do you want to start with that? And I'd like Robbie to grapple with that and maybe some of the other indicators in this survey. So, I, I mean, saying the economy is your biggest concern is the safest and easiest answer to give to a pollster. Correct. I agree. Um, in <laughs> the 2022 election, everybody said it was the economy, and it turned out it was abortion. But they didn't want to say that to the person asking them questions. That's a very personal thing. Um, so, to some extent, I question, once somebody is in the privacy of the voting booth, how much is that actually driving their vote? Um, but, but it's also, this is, it's like the last thing that you can say that's bipartisan, right? Like the economy is, I'm worried about, I'm worried about my pocketbook, I'm worried about my family, I'm worried about um, my kids. Um, but also, you know, the, a lot of that worried about my family and my kids has actually bled much more into cultural questions about what my kids are learning in school. I'm worried about who my family is surrounded by in our neighborhood. I'm worried about... Um, what kinds of things I'm going to have to confront, ideas I'm going to have to confront in my life. Um, and so from a, from a political psychology angle, the, the economic argument is always there. It makes sense. We all worry about money all the time. But it's not a deep driver. It's not one of those sort of primal, primal things that drive all of us from you know, the beginning of time. Because what drives us from the beginning of time is worry about our status and our identity and our group. And so to the extent that... The economy matters to everybody, yes, but how much, how deeply is it motivating people's vote is the question. But just to follow up, I, I think that's a really good point. And economic issues can be racialized or culturalized. There's a lot you can do with economics. I agree with that. Uh, but you know, Biden is kind of proud of being a lunch bucket labor Democrat. He has run um, you know, an effort over the last six months to lift up Bidenomics mm-hmm. uh, quite explicitly. Um, you know, people read my column. No, I'm quite personally quite sympathetic to that. And yet, this is really challenging. I, 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 I just throw the question again: Is 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 this not a challenge to him? What we're seeing here? Yeah, go ahead. I think it is. Go ahead. Go yeah, ahead. I think it is because I'm in New Mexico, and what I found when I go to northern New Mexico, which has been a historic, strong Democratic area, I'm starting to see holes. And and when I spoke with Hispanic ranchers, this the space where the Chicano movement began, where ranchers actually took over a courthouse in the 1960s, used violence. When I speak to them now, 
they're sort of leaning to uh, Republican. And it's not because they're embracing the national Republican model. It's because they have really deep disagreements with Democrats over endangered species. They're ranchers. They want to graze. They're fighting over water rights. They're fighting over access to lands that they signed in, in an agreement, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo in the 1800s. And they see Democrats, especially from the East Coast, not understanding the issues out the West. That allowing a cow to graze has been something that's going on for years. And if you pull back and say, no, we have to protect this frog or something, they get very angry. And then they try to petition the Department of Interior to say, hey, you're violating agreements that we've had in place for years. And the response they get is like, no, this is an environmental concern. To hell with your, econ- your economy. You need to change. So now there's this reaction this visceral reaction to what they perceive as democratic policies that's not being discussed in in mainstream media. And then as you try to go after this growing Hispanic vote, you get them and engage with them, but then you don't like what they have to say, so you try to impose your beliefs. And a lot of races that you'll see, and you'll see this in the upcoming election, they'll recruit Hispanics to run for office, especially in the House, but yet they'll hire white, controlled uh, political consultants they get things wrong, like what kind of music that would get us excited for a candidate. I don't know how many times I've been to events in New Mexico when they're playing salsa. Mexicans don't like salsa. (laughs) They're a Selena. (laughs) So you have a misunderstanding, this lack of engagement. And so I know the Biden administration, some of the, uh, or actually the Biden political consultants, are very concerned of what the direction of where Hispanic voters And it's going after years of disengagement. So some of these numbers are reflective of that. Now, I'm not saying they're shifting strongly to the Republican, but they're up for grasp because they don't feel like they're engaged. Yeah. And I would I would go to back to these numbers. And this is on figure 22. um, If You're following along at home uh, on page 42. If you look at concern about the economy of our party, race and generation, Hispanic voters stand out at 59 percent of being economically uh, in, uh, you know, concerned about the economy, black AAPI voters and white voters. White voters are actually the lowest concern, 43%. Then you go to non-college graduates, it's 51%. College graduates, not as concerned, obviously a bit more affluent. Mm-hmm. Then you go generationally, it's my generation, Gen X, that stands out as the most. But then closely behind them are millennials, who, again, are some of the most economically displaced due to COVID, and Generation Z, who have essentially had the last what, you know, several years of their lives sort of evaporated when they're in college, et cetera, they are high economic anxiety voters. Boomers and the silent generation are pretty good. Like, they're, 30%, they're 39% and under. So where, whereas the media did all of these stories where they would have, you know, a you know, white non-college voter, like, staring out of a window, thinking about, you know, and they're like, how, how can we try to understand MAGA voters? The economically anxious voters are not them. It's Latinos. It's young black and white Americans. It's AAPI voters. It's actually the voters who tend to vote Democratic. And they actually do vote on the economy. That's the irony. The people who the media has stereotyped as economically anxious, which is MAGA voters, they don't vote on the economy. Their interest is cultural. The things they vote on are cultural. I don't want the trans guy in the bathroom. That's how I'm voting. I don't want women to have abortions. That's what I'm voting. I don't like economic change. I'm demographically uh, panicked. I need to vote for the candidate who's going to make America great again, meaning it make it white and Christian again. Trump yesterday said, we're not going to let people in who aren't for our religion. What's our religion? He's not even religious, right? (laughs) I doubt he's ever been to church. Um, He's a two Corinthians, like, you know, (laughs) so, but, but he speaks for white evangelicals who are not economically anxious. They are older, his voters. They are more boomers. They are more silent generation. They have more money. It is Democratic voters who vote on the economy. And right now they are highly economically anxious, highly doubtful about Bidenomics, highly dubious about things like more electric grid. But does that mean no more jobs in the auto industry, the traditional auto industry, where a lot of them still work? And so I think Biden has some work to do in terms of the economy because all I hear from my kids' age and their friends is, I can't afford my rent. I can't afford the, my bills. I can't afford to live, and y'all are sending money to Ukraine. You have plenty of money when Ukraine wants money and no money for me. You have plenty of money when Israel and Gaza blow up into war. Suddenly you've got more money, and you're going to send them money, but you can't 
uh, cover my student loans. You can't forgive my student debt because we don't have any money, but you've got money for war. So the anxiety of young people, I think the Biden administration is not paying attention to, and the anger among younger voters and voters of color, Latino voters, is really a problem that I don't think that the Democrats have properly addressed. And Latinos are really big in the oil industry and oil workers. I live in New Mexico in the eastern part. The whole, the whole state's economy is based on oil and gas. Yeah. And it's one of the best jobs you can get without a college degree. Yeah. You can get ninety dollars to $150,000 working at oil fields. So when people say we need to get off fossil fuels, you're taking away this industry and you're not replacing it. You're doing it theoretically. You want to move to clean jobs. Well, can I walk out of that oil job on Friday and walk into a clean any, any, any job on Monday with the same price, the same salary? And you can't have that. So if you talk about taking us off fossil fuels, you're talking about shifting the economy. We don't want to become a West Virginia where we don't have jobs. And then you turn around and say, I need to get a Tesla. Well, I can't make a Tesla into a lowrider. Why do I want that car? <laughs> Not only that, the owner of Tesla is a, is, is a tool, is a product of apartheid. So you want me to get a car that I can't make myself. And by the way, inside is terrible. I know as a Mexican-American, I get in the car, I would totally want to fix it up with leopard prints. I can't do that because of right to repair. So you want to take my job and give me this car I don't want, you're going to have that anxiety. Let me, let me flip this around because we focused on some of the problems Biden has. I also looked at this survey and saw some real problems Trump uh, has. Uh, number one, and uh, Robbie, you can begin with this, talk a bit more about how the sort of single issues are now flipped particularly abortion, that's a radical change since uh, the Dobbs uh, decision. So that's on the one side. There are a whole bunch of issues Democrats have on their side that they, they didn't have before in terms of mobilizing the electorate. The other is that the, um, you know, the fact we, we, people keep saying, well, the more Trump is indicted, the more he goes up in the polls. That's not exactly right. Um, and I was struck by, on, on a whole series of questions, about a fifth of self-identified Republicans, 20%, which is a big chunk of uh, your own party, um, you know, think Trump committed crimes or worried about what this means. I mean, there's about a fifth of the Republican Party that's there. But even more strikingly, independents are uh, there. Just um, nearly six in 10 American, uh, um, uh, six in 10 independents see the re-election of Trump as a threat to American democracy. So Biden may have some challenges, but Trump has some really big ones, too, that I don't think we talk about enough. Can you talk about them a bit? And, or, am I, or am I wrong in the premise of my question? Yeah, well, I, you know, <laughs> look, I mean, neither of the candidates look great. I mean, when you look at those favorability numbers, I mean, in any other election, we'd be thinking, like, they're both screwed, right, in, in any other election. Um, but we know that's not the case, right? We know that they'll have like unfavorable views and vote, uh, you know, for him. And, I, and I, what's notable there is that um, we find very when we ask Republicans, like you know, who we know voted for Trump last time, would they vote for him again? Like, there's very few defectors, uh, right? So just they know they believe that even among that like 20 percent who believe he committed crimes, about half that group is still going to vote for him, right? So I think that's worth kind of like paying attention to. It, it doesn't quite mean what we think it might mean, right? That you can both believe, yeah, okay, he probably committed those crimes. But there is that kind of psychology of, but he's kind of our bully, uh, kind of operational uh, here, right? And so there's a kind of pass uh, given. Uh, it's, a, it's getting accomplished toward our ends uh, in, in a way uh, here. And, and so I, I think that's, that's part of the problem. But I think you're right on independence, um, that, that there there is maybe some looseness uh, here, and those will, those will matter, right? And, this, and the other big reminder, these are all national numbers, right? Um, we don't have numbers from Wisconsin or Michigan or Pennsylvania, uh, right, um, uh, uh, or, or Arizona or uh, Georgia or in North Carolina, right? So uh, those are where, what are, are those independents in play? Those places is where it will really matter. So we, we can't really speak, I think, to that. These are just national numbers, but uh, I mean... It, yeah, so I would say, like, yes, I think there is, you know, we should not think that Trump is invulnerable or, um, you know, I don't think anybody can catch him. I think, you know, clearly that's what we're showing here. There's nobody on the horizon that's going to step in and save the Republican Party from Trump. Um, that We're clearly not seeing that, um, you know, in, in the election. So we're going to have the Trump, it looks like it's going to be the Trump-Biden thing, uh, and, you know, we'll see. The, 
and remember, those states are really close, right? So a little bit of play uh, in Wisconsin, right? Uh, that could be game over. So, well, I mean, the, the, oh, no, I was just going to say that, you know, if you could come up with a, a less polarizing, more sort of Joe Normal Democrat than Joe Biden, I, I can't tell you who that would be. <laughs> uh, yeah. Joe Biden is just... He's, he's normal, you know? He's just a regular old politician, been around a long time. We've had Joe in our lives, most of our lives. He's been a politician forever and ever and ever. And yet, the, the, the percentage of people who say that Joe Biden, Joey, Joey, as is, as is that God love him, 86% of Republicans call him a threat to democracy. Now, the good news is it's more intense on the Democratic side. 91% say that Donald Trump is a threat to democracy. But just the, them being that close yeah. in percentages of people saying that the two of them, who could not be more different, and one of whom tried to overthrow the government. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But Biden, and all he's done is, I don't know, do like empathetic Joe Biden stuff, pass like infrastructure bills. Like he's done like bipartisan bills and stuff. How is he a threat to democracy? What's his voters? It's who voted for him because there's nothing he's done that's been other than the, his policy right now that I think is really polarizing inside of his party. He hasn't really been divisive. He's been very ecumenical. He's tried to separate MAGA Republicans from regular Republicans, and he's rhetorically always bipartisan. And yet Republicans view him as an absolute threat to democracy. And then you go down the list and generationally, the numbers to me also should be more different. Gen Z is, is, has the widest uh, gap, 61% of Gen Z say that Donald Trump is a threat, 45% say Biden is a threat. Millennials, it's 55, 56, it's almost tied. Gen X, 60, 58, that's like a tie. And baby boomers, 57 to 52. So that actually concerns me. And I wonder what you make of the fact that you have such an intensity of people saying that Biden is a threat to democracy. Yeah, that, that- can I just, uh, That's a great question. Yeah. Yeah. I'll be, be quick here. I want to make sure we get to uh, the audience. But I, I think this is a symbol where, like, the, where, where we, it's kind of broken, right? I mean, the, the, and, and we see it in some other numbers. Like, we have 8 in 10 uh, Republicans who say the Democratic Party has been taken over by socialists, right? 8 in 10 Democrats think the Republican Party has been taken over by racists, Right. Um, and in this survey. Right. Uh, and so I, I think the, the problem is and, and we, we know like in political science, like one of the biggest drivers has been this negative partisanship. It's demonizing the other party. Right. That, and, and it's been this. And EJ, even the ads you just mentioned. Right. Are all about that in Virginia. Right. It's it's not about like what our candidates going to do for us. It's like how awful the other party and the other candidates going to be. And I think that uh, churn cycle you know, uh, that we're going to see from campaign ads from now to November. Um, it's just going to kind of keep this up. And it leads to kind of a cynicism, right? Um, and, and particularly for independents who are a little bit less disengaged, all they hear, right, is that demonization both sides. And they, 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 they do end up kind of saying, yeah, well, maybe they are all the same, right? Um, they're equally corrupt. Maybe I like one or the other, but yeah, at the end end of the day, um, I kind of throw up my hands because that's all I hear. Yeah. One interesting thing, I want you to come in, at Liliana, and then I'm going to the audience and also just throw out some of these thoughts that we got from people off the survey. Um, this survey also pointed out that Biden and Trump may have their challenges with the electorate, but the, if you ran a no-labels candidate who was a Democrat, Joe Manchin, or a Republican, Larry Hogan, that no-labels candidate, each of them got 10% of the vote, the sample was split to test. So that that option is not is not something people are rushing to right. either. Right. Uh, but Liliana, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I think that it's it just makes it clear that it's not about Biden, yeah. right? Yes. We're not we're not they're not talking about Biden. And I think that you're you're both right that Democrats actually do care about the the statistics and the facts and what's happening in the economy. And Democrats love to talk about the numbers and like if I just get if I just tell them this number, they're gonna change their minds, right? But like what what Republicans know, what Trump really knows is that feelings don't care about your facts, right? Yeah. The you can tell a story that evokes a lot of emotion and fear and anger, and that will stick with people no matter how many numbers you tell them and no matter how many facts you give them. And and to, to this day, I think Democrats have not figured that out. Um, it, you know, it's, it's a noble thing to be able to, to want to say, like, these are the actual facts. And I believe that if I tell you these things, you will change your mind. Uh, but, but 
you know, that means that they're sort of fighting with one hand behind their back. Yeah, the 10-point plan never works when you try to go in communities of color. So here's the 10-point plan here. Uh, and you go into the barber shop, and the barber's like, man, I can't even read this, bro. I don't know what you're talking about. Mm-hmm. You, you cannot have engaged in that way. They want to know the narrative, yeah. not, a, not a list of facts. So let me just read. You can or cannot take it, any of these, but it's very interesting what people wrote us about um, um, this, this. God bless this person. How do you anticipate faith groups, especially churches, can use this information? Um, what are your thoughts on Shannon McGregor and others who say that the focus on polarization is a distraction from the real problem of the radicalization of the right? Uh, how important is the independent voter? Can ranked choice voting be part of the solution to this problem? Um, can liberal religion support liberal democracy? Um, how much is this period similar to the Gilded Age? And the person has a pretty good analysis uh, there. Um, how can we shift the focus away from symptoms uh, to root causes? Um, and um, um, uh, is, oh, a, a state representative wrote, apropos, I guess, of what's going on on Capitol Hill today, um, is it possible for moderate Dems and Republicans to work together despite the chatter of fringe elements of their party? So I'll, I'll just any of those. There are a lot of <laughs> others that we got, and I want to thank everyone for them. But any, just keep those in the back of your mind, sir. Uh, we have um, Mike. I'm going to go to the back first. Uh, whoever's closer to that gentleman right there. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you. I, I appreciate the panel and the information. I, I grew up in Columbus, Georgia, and, and, and in 1963, I got arrested trying to go to the all-white library when many people thought that was great, making America great. But it, it just seems like to me it was great for who? You, 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 you can't say that I'm a citizen and I was forced in civics to say, uh, if the memorize the Declaration of Independence and the parts of the Constitution, we the people, we the people didn't include me. My great grandfather was an enslaved person brought from Africa. And so while some people were partying and enjoying the prosperity in Columbus, Georgia, my people couldn't even go to the library, the uh, restaurants, the parks, and everything. And so, you know, we've got to acknowledge, you know, what existed. It was great for whom? And it was also bad for some people. Thank you. Well, uh, by the way, a good friend of mine, Teresa Tomlinson, used to be the mayor of Columbus, Georgia. So, um, and I will just say that I think that it, again, shows that the, the preferences on, particularly among Republicans and white evangelical Christians, is a nostalgia. It is, it is, a, it is a desire to believe that the past was actually gauzy and wonderful and a refusal to accept how horrible it was for people of color, for women, for indigenous people, for Latinos, for everyone but them. And I think there is a, a, a clinging to a pretense that this past that was so awful for almost everyone else was good for everyone because it was good for them. And I think there's a refusal to let it go, and Trump feeds into that. Can I just say one of the surprising things, we've been asking this question for a while, and everything you just said is true. And, but what you find is in a, new, a split among black Americans uh, on this question, that you know, black Protestants in the group uh, say that America's best days are behind us. Now, there are a lot of different reasons they might say that. They might say Trumpists are taking over. They might have economic difficulties. But that's been a fascinating finding that we keep running into, that the answer to that particular question is not um, you know, the one that might be expected, given the truth of the narrative you offered. Yeah. Well, I was going to say, can, 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 you, do you, can you compare how people felt about that when Obama was president? Because mm-hmm. people might be saying that because the, yeah. the decline culturally and civically post-Obama might be a part of that. They're saying, oh, America's best they days actually, are yeah, like no, 2008. They like actually are. I measured it in college among <laughs> undergrads, and they're nostalgic for Obama. It's for Obama. No. Yeah. yeah. I want to bring in a couple of people at the time. Let's, we've got three hands here. Could you keep your question short? Then I'll go to the other side, and, uh, because I want to make sure I get each side of the room in. So you go ahead. Uh, right here, here, and the gentleman back there. Hi, I'm Alan Johnson at Georgetown. So do you have any insights into American voters' attitudes toward the China issue or the North Korea issue, which are mentioned over and over again at the Republican primary debates? Thank you. Thank you. Please, welcome. It's good to see you. 
Thank you very much. I'd like to kind of challenge the way the questions are sometimes written. The ones about America's best days behind, uh, those questions I think should be recast in terms of white power. And do you think that whites have lost power since the good old days in the 50s? And power then was defined in part by who could vote. And up until the 50s, it was pretty much white people. The people in the cities didn't count, the people in the rural areas, and women. So white men and white power elected all tiers. And now you're talking about um, violence, but not voter suppression. And there's suppression in all levels, whether it's campuses or other locales, because it's not easy to block voters anymore. Thank you. Uh, Robbie, you can talk about the question wording. We've, we've yes. debated this very question. Sir. Yes, thank you. Um, I'd like somebody to perhaps explain uh, why it is that so much of the commentary about what has happened in the United States over the last four years amounts to characterizing it as threats to democracy, when in fact there have been many points along the process since the 2020 election that exhibit the fact that the, our democracy has worked pretty well. I mean, Trump lost 62 out of, or 61 out of 62 legal challenges. Um, there, there are just a lot of things that have gone well after being totally subservient to Trump for four years. Uh, Pence did his job in the Senate. And I, I won't go on to other things because there's, uh, time is of the essence, but we just don't hear enough about what has worked since 2020. So on all of these, just Robbie, specifically, we, did, we, did we poll much in this particular survey on the questions, the gentleman here? Just we do have, a, so at the end, uh, we have a, a question on foreign policy in, on page 63, where he asked about China here. And basically, the, the main question we have is whether China is an ally of the U.S., friendly but not an ally, unfriendly but not an enemy, or an enemy of the U.S. So we asked about Ukraine, Mexico, Hungary, China, and Russia. Uh, uh, in, in there. And what we found there is that um, it's only 16% of the country who says China is an ally uh, or friendly but not an ally. Um, it is 34% who say they're unfriendly but not an enemy, and it's half who sees China today as an enemy of the U.S. Again, these are end of August uh, numbers, right? So, North Korea. Uh, we don't have North Korea, unfortunately, yet. Yeah. The, uh, do you, anything on these other two questions uh, for Anyone, I mean, there are, just in defense of the survey, there have been questions more pointed than this one. We just found, we just asked the question this way because it was an interesting sort of, a, it was more a vibe question. We know what you say is true, and we have had a lot of questions about voter suppression and other things, but it was fascinating. This question proved to be quite instructive in terms of attitudes toward other things. Uh, do you have any response to this or the successes our democracy has had in the last uh, uh, well, four well, years? Well, if you've watched PBS uh, NewsHour on Fridays, when you see David Brooks will say, no, our institutions have held up. I, it's a great way to go into the week, and oh, everything's fine here. Uh, <laughs> so that's, always, that's what I always think of. But one of the things I think is looming, and we've talked about the polarization, is there are divisions about how we see America. And you see that back there, where white evangelicals are going one way, Hispanic Catholics and black Protestants are going another. And there's a lot of religious ignorance around the country of each other. One thing I've noticed that and when you engage with white evangelicals and you ask them questions, it goes down to their, in their theological view of the world, they emphasize the death and resurrection of Jesus and going to hell as a damnation, as a possibility. Hispanic, Protestant, or Hispanic Catholics and black Protestants Focus on the teachings of Jesus and fighting poverty. Focus on the least of these. Yes, they theologically agree with each other, but their emphasis describes their worldview. And if you go all the way back to the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King and the Civil Rights Movement, when people asked then Billy Graham, you know, what, how do you believe in civil rights? What do you endorse? And at first he was kind of lukewarm, and then he would later say, civil rights will, will come when Jesus comes back. So in the perspective of you're comfortable now, you have nothing to worry about, especially if you're white and privileged. But things will get better when Jesus comes back. So your poverty, you know, don't worry about that. It'll come. It's a privileged position that a lot of black and Hispanics just can't get their head around. Uh, real quick on this side, uh, that gentleman, uh, Peggy, uh, you always have to ask a question, Peggy. And uh, this is a, a, a woman over here. 
Sure. Um, the survey data is very scary. Um, and I know that you all are here to describe and analyze the data, but I would love to hear your thoughts about particularly how we get white people to calm down. Um, it seems like, uh, as Joy, you mentioned in your, your comments, you know, um, and it's just true, objectively speaking, white people have never had it better in American society. Uh, they're wealthier, they live longer, um, you know, well, they're, I, they're I, I would more educated than everybody else, uh, bit of you know, so... Caveat. <laughs> um, that, that white people have had it better. Um, they used to get to own black people. <laughs> and, they, um, and there is actually a huge disparity in life expectancy among white Americans, yeah. depending on whether you live in a red state or a blue state. White people are actually dying younger than black people at this point. Because if you control for political affiliation, if you live in a red state and you're white, you're likely to die eight years younger than if you live in Vermont. The reality is, because of public policy, white Americans in places like Kentucky and Tennessee and South Carolina and Mississippi are actually not doing better. They're doing far worse because they are supporting policies that actually make them sicker and make them deader. But they're doing it because they're not voting on things like the economy or on health care. They're voting strictly on culture and on this sense of loss of cultural primacy is more important to them. So when people say they're voting against their interests, I say you don't understand what they think their interests are. In their mind, their interest is to maintain uh, what W.B. Du Bois called the wages of whiteness. It is more important to have the cultural superiority of being white than it is to have health care, to have a dentist, to have access to a doctor. It, it just, that is their, that is what they're voting for. And they're actually not better off. Well, could I also say on that, there are, if you, depending on where you look in the country, there are white people who have suffered a lot because of the economic transformation of the country. Trump did particularly well in counties where there were high levels of foreclosures. He did particularly well in areas where old industrial jobs were particularly threatened. He didn't do better in places with high unemployment, right. but there is this economic unease that's been married to the cultural unease uh, for a big chunk of Americans who don't live in wealthy suburbs and don't fall into uh, these categories. So I think it is complicated uh, in that, that understanding this is, is really central to understanding the economic future. So thank you for your Although, question. Can Peggy, can, can you... The, 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 the most common Trump supporter is actually the richest white person in the yes. poorest place. That's right. So it's a person who has, they have status, but they are in a very vulnerable and delicate yeah, situation. Right. And they're and worried also, about becoming one of those people. And yeah, being non-college doesn't mean that you're poor. Right. Because I always, like, people put, poor, people put everything on poor white folks. They don't vote. Yeah. Poor, white people, poor people don't vote. Poor right. black people, poor brown people, poor Asian people. Poor people don't vote. Yeah. So don't put it on poor white people. It's rich white people. They voted for Trump, <laughs> not poor white people. They don't vote. Peggy. Hi, I'm Peggy Orchowski. I'm congressional Give Peggy her voice. Um, I wish there were more nuance to your questions. I'm sure um, you'd find more agreement if instead of saying, talking about a, abortion as something, it's either, either or, that I think most Americans agree there should be abortion with limits, say, 12 weeks, 15 weeks. You'd, you'd probably find more um, people agreeing if you did that. Uh, same with uh, immigration and between open borders and managed immigration, I'm sure you can find a lot of agreement among uh, Democrats and Republicans about how it should be managed and how. But my biggest question is, I think it was the last time I talked to you, EJ, which seemed like 10 years ago, when we were talking about the, the, the wonderful book, uh, How Democracies Die. And that book very much emphasizes liberal democracies. And that's a nuance I think is, is lacking. Are we talking about the disappearance of liberal democracy or federal democracy or state democracy? Or There's so many kinds of democracies. I think it would really help to um, at least include that word. I call some of this spin by omissions. Can, can I just really so quickly just What do you think about liberal democracy? Page 49, I just want to just correct one thing. 
the difference between all Americans, Republicans, and Democrats on whether abortion should be legal in most or all cases. 82% of Democrats say it should be legal in most or all cases. Only 38% of Republicans say that. So there, it actually, there isn't more agreement. There's actually the opposite of that, um, that Republicans are asked that. Now, it is true that only 17% of Republicans say that abortion should be illegal in all cases, um, and only f but only 4% of Democrats say that. So there is a huge difference on whether, by parties, people think abortion should be legal. Can, the, can uh, let's the, just bring in this young woman, and then we'll close, everybody, because I'm already over time here. <laughs> Please, thank you. Hi, thank you. Um, my name is yeah, Lily. Over here. Sorry. I just ran out of time. Lily Kincannon with the Bipartisan Policy Center. And I have a question about the data that was collected on um, Americans' views of teaching history to children. And we, you talked about what a positive number that is, the 94%. But I'm curious how you interacted with this idea that our perception of what is good and bad history might have swayed those results. Thank you. Uh, good for a representative of the Bipartisan <laughs> Policy Center to end on a relatively <laughs> positive note. Bless you for that. Um, why don't we, um, let me uh, go down the line and end with Robbie. He can defend all his questions, say it's all <laughs> nuanced. Uh, but uh, Joy, you start. Um, yeah, I, I will say to that point, that is good news that people actually at least have the, the goal. Um, uh, and, we, and there is a big difference of what people think positive history is. I think that is true. But I will just very quickly close by saying, uh, uh, if you will recall, well, maybe you won't recall because no one was alive then, in 1856, uh, we actually I had covered that election. Yeah. <laughs> As did I. Um, we're, we're OGs. Um, in 1856, we had the longest House Speaker vote in the history of the United States. Yes, that's true. Um, it was something like 138 130, ballots, yeah. right, to get to a speaker. The issue at issue was slavery. Hmm. Uh, it is that the remnants of the Whigs were opposed by what was emerging as the radical Republicans, which at that time just meant they really hated slavery. Um, and they uh, were demanding that uh, the party take an issue opposing the expansion of slavery in the United States. It broke the Whig Party, created the Republican Party. It's why it exists. Uh, not long after that, we had an actual civil war. So the good news is there's always been a side and a camp in the country that demands progress, um, that it is on the side of progress. Um, but the bad news is that this country has an incredibly violent history and a history of, of non-democracy and non-pluralistic uh, and, and, and being opposed to pluralistic multiracial democracy. That's just the history. So nothing about this is new. The information in this survey is bad news. Um, but as uh, Rachel Maddow says, history is here to help. We've been down this road before. The 1930s was much like this era, but we, including the fascism, the pro-Nazism. All of that existed in the 30s, a near overthrow of the government, all of it. Um, and we managed to cycle out of it. So the good news is that we might be at the bounce, that this might be the low point for now, and that we may bounce out of it. The bad news is we tend to bounce back. It's something about America that we just can't seem to stay up. And, Russell? and to answer the brother's question about how do we get people to, white people to calm down, I used to, for years, just use humor when people called. They would call and say, you're nothing but a Marxist. And I would say, a Richard Marxist or a, a Groucho Marxist. Uh, and of course, they always laugh. I was like, I love Richard Marxist and his 80s music. Uh, and it would be cool. I can't do that anymore because it's, there's just a visceral reaction when someone says, are you really legal? And I'll say, my damn name is Russell. I mean, that's my name. Uh, what do you think? I can't do that anymore because I'm getting this terrible, visceral reaction, and it's easy to get disenchanted and say the country is, is in real trouble. But then I remember our ancestors. We're talking about enslavement. I had an uncle who uh, was a World War II vet. He was a Holocaust liberator. And he came in, and he couldn't buy a home because he was Mexican, as did my grandfather. And I try to put myself in the position, and I know at one point in their lives, they felt that maybe we do need to be separated. Maybe we're not, we're inferior. Maybe we're incapable of love. But then they turned around and fought and did everything they can for someone like me and us to succeed. And I look at my daughters. They're going to be way more optimistic than we are. So I've got to put in perspective as we see this, we've got to remember that the next generation is coming, they're going to be more optimistic. They'll look at us and say we're a bunch of fools as, the, as our generation looked at our prior generation. Y'all were a bunch of fools with Jim Crow. So something's coming around, and we'll be okay. 
We may go through some things that are very tough. I don't think we'll see another Tulsa. But if we do, Joy and I will be here to report it. We're not going away. They may cancel our shows, but we'll be back. We'll find something else, and we'll report the news to you. Yeah. Um, I'll just address the democracy questions a little bit, which is, which is to say, as a political scientist, I'm saying the, the concept of, de- of democracy is very complicated. And nobody knows what we're talking about when we say we're a democracy, we're a republic, it's a federalist, is it liberal? Nobody knows. Uh, and so those terms are usually, it, they make people sound smart, but they're not, right? No, most, most Americans have no idea what they're, what they're about. I think one thing that I try to fall back on is some of the earliest theorists of democracy and political science, what they focused on was pluralism. Democracy at its core is a process by which we live with people who are different from us, and we work together to find the best possible outcome. To the extent that our democracy is doing that, it is healthy. But what we've seen right now is that the thing that structures our politics the most powerfully our parties, and has always structured our politics, our parties have taken two sides on that issue of pluralism. And when, the, when the, the political debate is around one of the central tenets of democracy itself, we can no longer have faith that that democracy is going to be okay. If we, can t- we can compromise on virtually everything else, but whether we become more pluralistic and actually you know, live out the promises of the Reconstruction Amendments in the Constitution that already exist, or whether we're going to go back to a time when you know, white Christian men were, got to do whatever they wanted and everybody else had to pay, had to pay the price for breaking the rules. That's a, there is, it's hard to find a compromise point in between those two things. That's more like a tug of war. And so when our parties organize our politics in this way over a question about democracy itself, I think that's when we really need to pay attention and allow, and, and the reason we talk about it is because we want the citizens to know this is, this is the underlying debate here. This is what we're talking about. And when you vote, try not to be distracted by all these other things, right? Think about the type of democracy you want to live in in the future. So hopefully we can stay, you know, these type of data help us to push forward with that storyline. And Robbie, are we going to get a uh, Richard Marxist question the next <laughs> Yeah, <right. laughs> Thinking of that meme now that's all over. Um, anyway, um, only people who are like my son's age will know what I'm talking about. But um, there's a Richard Marx meme going on. Um, anyway. Is there a Richard Marx meme? There is. Oh, yeah. I want yeah. to <laughs> <laughs> uh, So, you know, I'll close with some, some big picture things. So, uh, Joy, you were mentioning other times. And, you know, in my last book I wrote about Emmett Till in Mississippi. And you know, everybody knows he was, uh, his killers were acquitted in 67 minutes by an all-white, all-male jury. Uh, the thing that I guess I should have known but didn't know is that there was not a single person eligible, a black person eligible to be on that jury because there was not a single black person registered to vote in all of Tallahatchie County as late as 1955, right? Now, that's not that long ago, and we kind of think about that, right? So there's ways in which we've been here before, but I think... And not because they didn't want to be registered. That's right. They, no, they, no, there was... No lynchings and terror and, you know, all of that, right, and, and all kinds of other um, legal and extra legal uh, ways of preventing, of forcing that uh, outcome. What I'm, I, I think, struck by, though, is what's different about our time is that even then, uh, the, in, in place at Tallahatchie County, it was a little tricky because there were more black voters, uh, possible voters than white voters, um, but in most of the country, uh, in, in most of the country's existence, there's been this sense that there are enough white Christian voters, that if we all voted, we win, right? That's no longer true. And I think that's the new thing that we're struggling with, right? That's what's changed and why this current iteration of it has this visceral thing. I'm, I'm with you, Joy. I, I really hope that we are at a kind of, I think it's great, but at the bounce point, right, where we are finding our way. And it is this, this question. I mean, it, the version of Christianity that landed on the shores of this country was the idea that these lands were intended by God to be used by us European Christians. Like, that's the version of Christianity that landed on the shore. So the, to the question of, like, white people calming down, I think there's, like, really important work being done in white Christian churches along this line, actually. Um, I've been in about 130 churches over the last three years who want to talk about white supremacy. Like, that was not happening even five years ago. Right, um, like w- not just talk about racial justice, but wanting to talk about white supremacy, and would even put that on the marquee outside the church. Right, that's new, I think, happening. So I do think 
we're struggling with this moment. But I think that really is the fundamental question, right? Is, is who's this country for? Who owns this country? Who are real Americans, right? That's really what these elections are about and what this data is really pointing us to. And we are struggling and the fever is high, I think, right now. And I, I'm, I'll end on this. I'm hopeful, right, that the fever will break um, soon. But that's, we're in the midst of that struggle right now. Well, I want to bring up my friend uh, Bill Galston to close. I just want to say, Peggy, your question reminded me of the <coughs> late Jack Kemp, one of the great upbeat, you know, racially open uh, Republican conservatives who always was very careful when he defended liberal democracy because he didn't want anybody to think he was a liberal. Right. So he would always say, small L, small D. And I do think when we talk about uh, and then he'd write me a, a, a friendly, nasty note about how wrong I was about taxes, but in a very warm way. Yes. So I, I love Jack Kemp. But, um, you know, I think we're assuming a liberal democracy, meaning free speech, free press, uh, freedom of assembly. Uh, when we, we talk about this, I agree with the gentleman. We made it so far. Uh, we shouldn't overlook the successes. But I think the survey shows us that people aren't crazy to be worried. I'm not saying you said that, but I think there's a real anxiety about whether these institutions can survive the degree of change that we've had. Uh, and so we can honor that we made it so far, but we can uh, be very concerned about what we need to do to go forward. And Bill is gonna give us marching orders, uh, so he'll tell us where we need to go. Go ahead, Bill. Fix it, Bill. Fix it all. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you got three now. minutes. <laughs> He's a really good philosopher, yeah. Bill. <laughs> I have no idea where we're going. <laughs> but I will, I will close with a brief story. Uh, take you back to the year 1965, when two fundamental pieces of legislation were enacted, the Voting Rights Act and the Hart Seller Immigration Reform yeah. Bill. The first one hit American politics and culture like a time bomb. The second one hit like a time release capsule. Okay, and we changed our voting habits by historical standards almost overnight. But it has taken us six decades to understand that from a demographic standpoint, immigration reform created a dynamic that fundamentally changed the country. And the battle that we've been discussing on this panel is, I think, fundamentally a battle about how as a country, as a culture, as a polity, we cope with the changes that you know, the American government, backed by the American people, authorized, but which had consequences that many of the people who supported that legislation at the time did not fully understand and anticipate. So now we have come to the realization you know, that our forefathers 60 years ago authorized in the name of the American people a fundamental change in America. Now, what do we do with that change? Right? And you know, how can we make it normal, acceptable, the basis of conversation rather than the basis of contestation? I don't know the answer to that question, but I do have a hunch that that's the question. Thank you all for attending, for those hundreds of people online, uh, I'm quite sure that it hasn't been boring. And <laughs> thanks to Robbie and our panel.